All conversations and information exchanged during participation in this podcast or interaction on the doctor.com website is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Do not confuse this with treatment or physician medical advice or direction per se. You must always follow your medical professional's advice and direction. Nothing on these podcasts or posted on this site supplements or supersedes the relationship and direction of your medical caretakers. Please understand, I am not playing the role of physician in this environment per se. I'm educating. I am a licensed physician with specialty boards in American Board of Internal Medicine and American Board of Addiction Medicine. Hey, this is Dr. Drew, and you are listening to This Life with Bob Floyd and Dr. Drew. Here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gather around that iPad or that iPhone for another episode of This Life with Dr. Drew and Bob. Yeah. And Shelly today. Shelly Spray. Hello, everyone. My, you should be the third person or be the second person. Be the you should just always be on this person. live. Anytime you want. She is okay. welcome. She Trust is me. our partner and friend and colleague. Shelly the Shark. Yes, thank you. <laughs> she doesn't like <laughs> that, that term. But you know, that they, you know you're crazy. like Jerry West. I know you love the Lakers. So Jerry West hated the term Zeke from Cabin Creek. Oh. He hated it. It, it made his skin stuck. crawl. Elgin Baylor, the great forward for the Lakers, he's still known as Zeke from Cabin Creek. And I know you hate the Shelly the Shark monitor. I do because it's, it's hysterical <laughs> that, that that's what stuck out of everything. Well, <laughs> we have a president who's great at naming people. Mm. Shelly the Shark. It's weird how things oh, like I that can. just stick. I, right? I know, it's Move hysterical. Your mic away from it, your really mouth is. a little bit. Me? Yeah. Yeah. So Shelly the Shark is here. Yeah. We're going to have Simon Adeline in here in just a second. She has a, a book called Everything is Possible. She has a, uh Amazon Prime series called Wishwall. We'll talk to her about that in a minute. Cool, but, cool. But first, we're going to talk to Shelly. So your daughter's going... Can we talk about it? Yes. What's, yeah, let's to, talk about did it. She let's choose, go. Did she choose Whittier? No. Oh, my God. No, Shelly was she losing did her mind. not choose Whittier. She chose Mills, Mills College. Mills College. Great school. All girls... Liberal Arts College. It's up in Northern California. In but Northern California. Very high quality. Gorgeous. Very high quality pot Extremely, up there, baby. <laughs> she will come yeah. back. She will come back a changed person. I know, but, but you oh, yes, know what I told might. her? You know what I said to her? I said, just please... Keep in mind that you can come back as changed as you'd like, but please just come back and don't wear Birkenstocks. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> I said the same thing to Paulina. <laughs> and what happened? She got Birkenstocks. See? Birkenstocks. That's what's going to happen now because I said it. But yeah. she now got, she's she got over the phase. It didn't last very long. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Fingers but, crossed. Um, so she went to an all-women's college, too. You don't say oh. girls' school; you say women's institution. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I I am very new at all of these the political uh, correctness. You know, I, I am very put new. Down at Birkenstocks. This. I went to Bloomingdale's the other day, and they had some really cute Birkenstocks. Well, they have new ones. They cost now. like four hundred dollars. Is anybody aware of that? <laughs> no, I'm not were. because I've never priced uh, them. <laughs> one of the, one of the reason I'm happy to see Manette is coming in is because she was a is a fashion model, and she has a fashion company. And so, if you're sale, you can go nuts on that. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm very excited about this. Actually, so, I must tell you, I'm very excited. So, about Mills, 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 I think Thelonious Monster played there. I don't want to. I don't want to scare you. You Shelley. can't be serious. <laughs> yes, you I can't think be. So. No, there's no way. <laughs> yes, Mills uh-uh. College. They did how not do, let how you the hell would I gate. know that it's in Northern California? They wouldn't it's... let you in that gate. I know they wouldn't have. <laughs> They don't, so, you no. know, Shelly wanted to go to Whittier, Richard Nixon's alma mater, and she was had a full scholarship this to Whittier. a better Whittier. choice. Full scholarship yeah. to Whittier, no mm-hmm. money, pay yeah, no it's money. pretty good deal, but Mills is an amazing place. Well, I, we went there, yeah. and it was an amazing place, yeah. and I could see that she felt very relaxed there. Mm-hmm. It's a tiny college. Yeah. I think that's what's good for her. Yeah. She's probably going to need people to really engage her, you know, as opposed to Berkeley They'll grind her. or a place. They'll grind her. They'll, They'll they get will, more one-on-one. They that, will teach the one-on-one, her. One, I think, is really going to be crucial mm-hmm. for her. Agreed. Um, she loves that kind of work, and, and she deserves it. She's worked hard. She has worked She's hard. She's a great they kid. Also work so Can hard we just college? say, yeah. we criticize so much parenting. Shelly's done such a great job with Oh, Ivy. thank Ama- you. I told you that a few months you ago did. when we were talking. I, I really could cry. She's done that. an amazing Aww. job. Thank you so much. We're co- you know, two junkies coming from the Scream Club in Hollywood. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. you became a great mom. <laughs> I, 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 feel so, I feel so lucky that I was able to get it together, you know, before... I was, you know, a mom because I really know that I could have made some serious mistakes and a lot of damage if I wasn't sober. Some of your trauma was from your mom. 
some of my trauma was from my mom and you know and those things you know always do play a role they, they, um i was intergenerational yeah i was yeah. able to to change what needed to be changed and i think that we were able to move forward um in in my parenting and and as well as i mean her dad has been there every step of the way i think mm. it's crucial He's a calming influence but you're the one making it happen well i'm definitely the uh the locomotive <laughs> the that is pushing along <laughs> you know the creativity and and that's what sometimes you need is that somebody to come in and and say yep that's great you're super talented but what are we going to do to get to the next step and work how's that going a uh, work is, you know, the the recovery uh, field has changed a lot since we were together working. It's not in, even inpatient. the same field. It's anymore. not the same field anymore. It's it's a real struggle for me to to open my mind and change things for for. Uh, the clients and know deep down kind of what they need, but them not being really ready to hear it. Well, let's but talk it because let's let's do modern treatment so Drew can understand our frustrations. Right? You're always we were always under the assumption that junkies are amazing. They just need to stop taking drugs and they will embrace this community and figure it out. Much like Shelley and I and Adam and Anthony and everyone you know did. That these people are not like that. No, I get that. I get that. So then treatment becomes how to get a job, how to talk to your parents, like the most primal basics of life that you just become exhausted by it all because the drugs are always looming there. The addiction is always looming there. They're going to get caught by the addiction anyways, and we have to teach them how to talk to their parents. But the the 12-step community always captured that, right? They're They're tired of it. I would think twelve step. You got to be grown up to be in twelve steps now. Mm-hmm. I think I think there's been a last five, six, seven years. Like, listen, I don't know your mother. I'm not going to talk. I've had sp- guys that I sponsor who's sponsoring guys who the sponsee wants them to talk to their mother. Oh yeah, like that AA ain't going to do that. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's a nice blend of, you know skill building and mental health. Oh, see, she has all the clinical terms for it. (laughs) (laughs) Talking to your parents is a skill building, Drew. It it is. I mean, these guys are 18, 19 years old. You know, they don't have the skills and they weren't raised by people who taught them, you know, these, these autonomy, early skills. And, and, um, yeah, the autonomy is not there. Um, but I think ultimately there's a lot of mental illness, that is being personality, covered up. Personality or organic? I think personality we, is a we, huge... We were always dealing with trauma. Is, is trauma the underlying... Trauma is the yeah. underlying factor. Yeah. And the trauma is being... Um, is it a different kind of trauma? Is it not sexual It's not abuse? sexual and physical abuse. I, I would say a third of my clients ha- do not have f- physical or sexual abuse. Right. So, they so have what is it? Enmeshment and mm, just... Uh, uh, emotional just trauma. Icky. It's just Covert. It's covert. <laughs> yeah. It's covert the covert stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think we've dealt with a lot of the overt sort of abuse. Yeah. Um, we've put that on Front Street. People are aware now of how to behave and, and how to raise children within protect a certain them, frame, framework of, of health and, and, and wellness. But I think the covert stuff that still people struggle with and don't get therapy, the parents don't get therapy. Well, the parents so were the product of the overt on. abuse. Now they're performing covert, covert abuse on the kids. Yeah. And I mean, again, I don't think it's anyone's particular fault that these things are happening. I think it's just the evolution of you know how American society works and how we're moving forward in in our our progress. Isn't it as, weird that the overt culture. abuse is not as disabling as the covert abuse has become? That's crazy, Isn't right? Isn't that weird? So another it thing, is odd. Remember, it is remember odd. you used to say, like, whenever you started using, using that's where you stopped emotionally developing, yeah, yeah. right? So kids use it at an earlier age. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. 15, Oof, 14. I know. I'm seeing 10. 10. 10. 10. Right? 10. So... Oh. So on top is of that, that is, also- is this available in the medicine cabinet, or, or is it pot? It's weed. Oh. It's yeah. ten, and it's weed, and it's it's just it's under. I think people just are not educated around substances and what they do to the brain, just on a scientific level. Right. It's really yeah. not a moral issue. It's that are they don't want to hear put it though. Something in your they brain. S- they at hear morality old. when you say, you know, pot is not for children. Is my simplest yeah. slogan. 
right? And I consider America considers people children until they're 18. So pot is not for children. Or alcohol. Y- you sound like a moralist, and then you get attacked. Oof. Oh, you're just closed-minded, or what's oh. your problem? You're Mr. AA guy. I'm like, no, it's a scientific <laughs> fucking fact. Yeah. Well, where are they getting the pot? Everywhere. Moms yeah, go I've... Moms go sign up my clients to get their medical marijuana no, the kids, when the they're kids, 15. The moms get... Well, ten is an extreme. Yeah. See, now I we've said ten, 10, 10 really low, but but, but yeah. fourteen, I mean, fifteen, moms are going and helping their children get medical marijuana cards. This is ten years ago mm-hmm. for anxiety, and I'm just like, why? Why didn't you ask why a fourteen year old's anxious? Because they have pimples. That's why they're anxious. Oh People God. don't like them. That's happened to every fourteen year old in the history of America. Wow. And they're getting so a they're marijuana. Getting for anxiety. How is that, Drew? You're a doctor. How do these doctors say <laughs> marijuana is an anxiety-relieving drug? It, because it has some short-term anxiety-relieving effect for some people. It always people. made me paranoid. Right, me too. Me too. But it has some people it will affect anxiety. Short-term, long-term, it makes long it worse. Long-term, it makes it worse. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm talking to these kids about is that their brains are wired on cannabis because they've been smoking it so long. They come off the cannabis. They feel worse. Yeah, sure. You know, as, as we know they, they would. Six Months, the, the withdrawal, they can't eat, they can't sleep, um, they're anxious. And I mean, they're real. And they can't sleep. They, they can't can. sleep. And, and <coughs> then they just go back on it because, you know, how our, our society is right now is like weed is the cure-all for everything that's, that's a problem. And I don't know how that happens. Panacea is the word Drew uses But that. I would imagine the reason why it's, it's that way is because I think it's now producing money. Oh, sure. Billions. So, oh, billions. Oh, yeah. so whenever I see in, in America, in my experience, is that whenever I see things making millions or billions, oh, yeah. it becomes... I have said it forever. There will be big tobacco will be replaced by big cannabis. And I Absolutely. feel like that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm looking at that and I'm wondering, am I up for this one? Am I up for this fight? Well, let's get back to the clients themselves. Yeah, so, it's an interesting question. So when you right? got... Well, I don't know. But I, you, I've stopped fighting. It. But Drew, yeah, yeah. Drew, when you got somebody off of heroin, yeah. right? Pick any one of the thousands of people you helped get off heroin. Yeah. They knew what to do to thrive. You now have a generation of young people who don't not, do not know what, what to do in order you, you to know achieve what? I, thriving. I would argue... I would argue that most of the heroin addicts we treated had a misguided sense of what they needed to do to thrive. They needed to adjust a lot of ideas about living, but they could. They were, well, they, but they were competent. They were, they were competent. competent. Yeah, yeah. And, and they had some competencies. You're but, saying there's but, no competencies but also, now, which is crazy. But let's look at this, though, Bob. Now you have to look at this. The people that tr- you guys treated. Had I'm talking about when I was his client. I'm talking about the 80s. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But you guys, yeah, but you don't understand what we're treating now. People back then who got treatment, pe- parents or someone paid for it. Yeah. Now people have insurance and their parents are paying $500 a month to get whatever taken care of by that by that insurance policy. And the thing is, is we are not seeing the same population as you guys were seeing then. People didn't go to treatment. People went to the methadone clinic. So these clinic. people never these went. To, guys, they didn't get access to treatment. No. The low functioning people. No, let's say. no, they went to methadone clinics and they were on methadone, just like they're going to be given Suboxone or they're going to give. Be so, benzos. so what she's saying is, you were dealing with elite. Wealthy musicians yeah. and it's artists. Not true. It's not true necessarily, but but your point is well taken. That there's there's more people awareness of treatment coming to treatment, less yes, willing to go to methadone treatment, more treatment. access to but treatment. Let's what's what's there between methadone maintenance and weed maintenance? Nothing really. Okay, that's so, what I'm saying is that there's nothing really, but maintenance for people who need maintenance. Why do they need maintenance, and what is the difference? Because those That's are the questions we, we don't know. I'm well, having. So the why was it created in the first place? It was created because the original opioid addicts, junkies, as they were known in the 40s and 50s, were criminals and non-functioning lowest leb, uh, you know, le- mm-hmm. ebb of the f- food chain. So let's just monitor them and keep them safe and keep them sed- sated. What, what I'm saying is a lot of these people are never going to have a job. I don't know that they could work a job. Well, they, it, it, I would I, argue. Is that just the millennial thing? Weren't that? you with me when I talked to It's Dr. even younger than millennials. I with, don't know when millennials are anymore. Are, are, I've been yeah. crucified. They're, they're 30 for, now. They're mid 30s? 
Yeah. They're 30 I think now. it's 18 to 36. Yes, exactly. I think it's like, I think 18 is the next generation. No, like, that, I think it's that's like, Generation Z. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's like 22 to 36. Yes. Okay. Um, but uh, I have a 36-year-old. So think- I have a 36-year-old client who still gets an allowance from his parents. Oof. Weren't, weren't you? <laughs> you do too, if you think about it. Of course, of course, of course. Wait, Allowances. Don't you? Yes. Yes. don't you? Oh well, yeah. that's a family trust. That's different. Oh, oh, my, God. oh, oh my God! Oh my God! Is that's... that a, is that different? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> no. much more sterile and oh, just yeah, comes just in the mail. You don't yeah, you don't have allowance. to go to dinner with them. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that's fascinating. But never mind. Sorry, I interesting. Called yeah, interesting. But but weren't you with me when we spoke with Doctor Dole, the guy that invented the whole methadone? thing yeah yeah and he was saying he he did he was more naive than than we are now and he thought he was going to restore people to work he thought he was going to get people off drugs and he thought they were all going to do 12 step yeah. he thought they were all going to do treatment too well and then that's it became interesting these i really things. need the, the i need the uh the stat sheet on that because that's what they're telling me that these cannabis folks are going to do gonna and i don't see it well i see it at yeah. carl's jr Oh, they are okay. stoned out, out of, of their, their minds, minds working at, at at fast food. Yeah, stoned. like they just they have these pot brain freezes, yeah. Yeah. and you have to fill in the gap for them. You know, like they they just it's I think amazing. That's what happened I'm, at that burger place we were at in New York that one night? We, people we are went stoned. The restaurant. It was like took can forever. I, can yeah. I get a glass of water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> Ten minutes later, can I get a glass? Of, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll get it, and then twenty it's minutes later, rudeness. No it's not rudeness. They're stoned. I'm telling you. Have you seen the scromiting yet? The, What's the, that? The intractable vomiting from a uh, pot. Oh, I no. I haven't yeah. seen it. I would love to wait, see that. Wait, wait. If they smoke enough, they'll start getting these intractable episodes of vomiting. Wait, and wait. they take hot showers. It's the only thing that'll break it. Really? Yeah. Because I do have this one client. Keeps vomiting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, they keep... It's pot. <gasps> I'm so glad I came here today. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was originally, so it was originally called scromiting because the vomiting was so intense they would scream and oh vomit God. at the same time. Oh, my God. And now Scrum. they're getting burns because they, they're in the hot shower like so much day. trying to get it to break. I was literally standing at the front desk. And they vomited in the lobby? Right next to me. <laughs> right Shelly's next. not a big vomit person. I'm yeah. not a fan. Doesn't really like I mean, vomit. I'm not a fan. Who I is used to a vomit. Fan? Come I used to vomit all the time. <laughs> Come on. I didn't and on bother celebrity me rehab, anyway. she had to clean it up all the time. Listen, listen. When I was vomiting, that was one thing. Dealing with other people's vomit is a whole different story. Okay. Maybe we should move let's on to fashion. Do. No, let's bring on a fashion. Yeah, right? let's let's clean, clean my palate. Clean the palate. Okay. Clean the palate. We are going to bring in our our fashion expert, Simonetta Lean. Simonetta, welcome to the program. Sorry, it was in. We're, welcome. There you are. Welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Rescue thank you us. So much. Reg- rescue us. Yes. Oh, by the way, I just want to say I am a millennial. So I hope I'm welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, they started, Millennial Generation starting in 1981. So, I'm, oh, 81. so pretty much. Okay. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm 36, so I'm. There Pretty it is. much there. You're right in the. You're I don't right know. The I try. I try to advocate for my generation. So if you like, we can even talk about that a little bit because right. I think that our, uh, you know, a little bit of a stigma in the generation, and I actually see a lot of millennials that do a lot of things. So I work very, very hard. So, yes, well, that, that, no, that, we, we said, we're not, we're point not, of view, we're not saying there's point. not high achieving no, millennials. We, Mark we Zuckerberg's just, a millennial. We just see a lot <laughs> okay. of the low, lower functioning folks. So we're a little biased. I, every generation has a personality, right? I'm a part of this. this since we've been talking about generations, actually, me and my friends are no generation. Oh, like oh, technically, really? yeah, there's this five year gap in 60 to 65 that it's really not a baby boomer and it's really not a Gen Xer. Yeah. And that's me, Flea, Anthony, Pete. Everyone I know is born in that era. Mm. We are we are our too own much kind of world. Yeah, too much change <laughs> well, to be a baby boomer for these no, it's, guys. It's what they call these overlap. Yeah. These overlap generation. The, I, the I would transition. consider you guys really Gen Gen X. Gen X. We we yeah. are the creators of Gen I X. I think you guys did actually <laughs> pioneer Gen X. I think right. Simonetta's right on the on the border too. She's, a, right. she's an yeah. overachiever. Yeah, you're actually so, you could be yeah. interpreted as a borderline Gen Xer. Yes, definitely. She could. Yes. She could. Sure. I mean, kind of. Actually, um, I don't know. It, it, eventually, I as a millennial, I see, of course, a difference. I I was born definitely with 
Um, actually, no, I transformed myself with a cell phone because I wasn't born with a cell phone. There are definitely millennials that yeah. are born with a cell phone and, you know, social media. So that is, of course, also my type of, um, I would say, communication. Right. But I, I'm i born like you're saying. So I'm kind of, I consider right. myself like an old soul. Um, but, but of course, I also have those tools. So I think it's pretty cool because I can learn, I would say, from the past and you know, still use, of you, course, all these amazing tools that, of course, social media, to me, it was one of the biggest revolution that we had, of course, in, in both ways, in a very positive way, because it gave a lot of uh, freedom to a lot of people and also a possibility to create their own world, their own jobs, their own reality. On, on the other end, of course, also negative when, you know, it becomes uh, too much borderline I, I myself you know you guys were talking about uh, mental illness um i myself found you know speaking about that because in social media there's a lot of that you know that uh anxiety that uh you know the the the, the, the idea that you have to be always perfect and out there and then of course in a click you are in front of the entire world so of course again to me it was a blessing because for instance to me it was part of uh, definitely helping me with my career. Um, but, but I see, of course, all, all these problems. And I don't know, I think we are in a kind of a moment, a transitional moment where I hope at least we are recuperating, you know, the old ways and the, to me, that the school, the, um, I don't know, the, what, what we had in, in the past to, of course, um, bringing it back to, the new ways, I would say, at least that is my hope. You know, that's what I'm trying to, to, to do because uh, social media can be also tricky, uh, of course. Well, yeah, let definitely. me, let me ask you this. So, so what social media did for you, you were a model. It empowered models. Yes. It empowered you where you had more power. Cause a lot of my acquaintances are models. And in that generation, yes. the Shelley's laughing. <laughs> I know some models. So it gave them their ability to brand themselves. They just weren't this piece of meat that could be thrown and sold for a thousand dollars. Look at Shelly. Look at, I just know models. What are you talking about? Stop looking they at me no like news. that. <laughs> but, but it was true. It was very empowering for, you know, models that aren't, aren't on, necessarily on the cover of Italian Vogue every month. It, and you weren't mm-hmm. just taking any job the agency told you to do because you could create this brand about yourself. Almost you could make yeah. yourself more famous than the institutions could. Yeah, a brand. A brand. Right. And yeah. I thought I, that, yeah. that was probably what you're referring to. You, you could take control of your career better than models of a generation before. Absolutely. In fact, there are so many uh, millennials, or also younger than that, that ask me, "Oh, I want to be a model. What would you, you know, what would you think I should do?" So, of course, there are many ways. There's, you know, the classic model way. So, meaning New Year Fashion Week, you go casting to casting, and that is, you know, the old-fashioned way, and that's one way. Social media gave me, for instance, the opportunity, like you were saying, to create my own brand, brand, and so my own audience. And so honestly, I don't have to do that. I didn't want to do that. I started when I was 16. And this is, of course, my personal story. I'm not saying that is, you know, the story of everyone. But for me, I remember I was, you know, starting to do the catwalk. I was a pretty girl, was very young. And they told me, hey, if you really want to, you know, be a top, you have to stop eating. Basically, that's what I've been told. Uh, and I boo. looked at this guy. I'm like, what? Boo. He said, yo, you're very tall. You know, you're very pretty. But you have, you know, to really watch out, you know. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, so my father's a medical doctor. Good. My mother's I'm a, a psychotherapist. I was, I, I found myself as a team talking with them. I'm like, mm, no. Well, so of course, that see? was a dream Good. of mine. Did you see the kid? But the kid in a, just collapsed. In a way, I was shocked by what that guy told me. Good. But and listen, so, well, hold um, on, one, hold on one, one second. This is newsworthy. In Sao Paulo, at a show, night before last, a kid collapsed, a male model collapsed and died on the catwalk. Mm-hmm. Oh my because God, they're starving sure. themselves to death. They're uh-huh. using medications to yeah. not eat. Uh-huh. It's still going on yeah. today. It is. Yeah. Today, right now, starve yourself in order to look right on a magazine cover. Right. Yeah it's, yeah, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong, and I'm so glad. It's that very you, sad. I'm so glad that that you are are against that, and you were raised by a, a medical doctor who in, encouraged you to 
you know, be healthy because that's the message we need to be sending to folks. Absolutely. Is to be healthy. Absolutely. I was, I, I still remember it. It seems so vivid to me. I was shocked by what this guy said. And of course, you guys were talking about, you know, drugs addiction. There's a lot, you know, they, they just of go course. on cocaine because they of have course. not to eat and perform, you know. And, and that's why to me, social media was uh, a blessing because again, gave me the opportunity to create my own brand. Of course, uh, again, I am a model. It's part of my job. I'm also a writer. I write for Forbes. I write for the entrepreneur. When I actually, you were asking me before about my book, I actually uh, was also working for Vanity Fair. I am my uh, own uh, novel published. I was working television, radio. So that is my background. So that is part of, um, you know, my career, I would say. But social media gave me the opportunity to bring everything that I had to say and create a name for myself and a brand for myself. And so now, of course, you know, when I model that come because of me, because of my name, because, of course, of what I represent. And that's actually if I have to talk really like a sister to a young girl, I would say, go with social media. Like create your own thing. You mm-hmm. can absolutely be a beautiful model, whatever your shape, whatever your body is. Of course, you have to be uh, just, how could you say, aware of the more, I would say more the message that you send out there. And and there's so, so many brands that will want you as their model because you represent that particular thing and you don't need to starve, you know. I think to, it's a great be, message that, that we stop telling people that they need to starve so that they can be successful because I think it's wrong. But the Jews, Jews been thinking a lot about this. No, what do you think? Well, I'm just thinking t- the business model is selling clothing. Yes. And they don't care about the models. They sell, no. care about selling the clothing. Right. And if they need a certain thing to sell the clothing, that's what they're going to get. Then uh, put it on a hanger. I'm just saying that. that so that <laughs> that's what they want them to look like. But if you, hangers. but if you want to be a model, mm-hmm. says the girl wanna, that weighs 86 pounds. Right. I do not. <laughs> I do not. But if you don't think you were influenced in some but you, way. But if you want to be a model, your job is to sell products. Sure. But again, nowadays, brands to sell, they go, yes, of course, they have traditional models that do their shows, but they go to influencers because they want, you know, something more genuine, something more, you know, that actually, of course, uh, can appeal a lot, a lot of people with our, of course, so, their followers. Okay. So, so and, if, and that's why, again, like I say, it's tricky. It's not always positive, but at least it gave, you know, a broader uh, possibility to uh, girls and of course also men that have that passion to create something to me that it's also deeper because I was talking about message you know sometimes like you were saying you, you imagine a model you just see a body well with social media you have much more than that because you lifestyle, have to you know lifestyle. say things you have to write things you use your mind. You have lifestyle. I mean, well, I, the I, important what I think what she's saying though is that if the brands are smart. They'll use other brands to sell their brands, Absolutely. not necessarily right. models to sell their oh, brands. I just yes, can't definitely. believe how many yeah, times definitely. the word brand is used in a typical everyday conversation. Well, the, the other side I was of... talking with the Skinny Confidential people. That's what they talk about, their brand. I, I talked to musicians at Coachella. That's They're a their brand. brand. Yeah. Everybody's a brand. If everybody's I'm a brand, Bob, then nobody's a brand. This is not a brand. <laughs> if everybody's a brand, then nobody's a brand, though. <laughs> What? Yeah, right. If everybody's a brand, then nobody's, nobody's a, brand. a brand. Yeah. Right. Apparently, I've been told I am a brand. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel like a brand. No, but you know what? When I was modeling, I, I never used an agency, and I I used radio to do my to, social media, and that mm-hmm. was how I got you know work for myself. But but if she has a million followers, of course she's going to have the opportunity to get on the runway because they're going to want her to promote what right. yeah they want right. That's of course. The yeah of course. it's a snake yeah. that eats off itself it's the, the, the brand created. selling the brands but you Shelly's a brand a... why why are you why are you shunning the brand thing I'm not shunning the brand Somebody thing. came I up to me feel... and asked me like you're so genuine and authentic I really want to get to know like like that it's a hustle of some sort. Uh-huh. Like genuineness and authenticity. It's a brand, oh, Drew. Oh <laughs> That's the world we're living in. I just you know don't what? like I, I just don't really I don't really buy into all of that stuff. I mean, maybe to my demise. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I just really have a problem with I don't really love the idea of having to put out or promote something. Let's not we've always let it hang that. out, all hang out. Shelly calls me two months ago. She goes, Bob, I need I need to talk to you. I go, Okay, what's up? And she goes, 
Ivy's going to school and I'm going to need more money. So I'm going to need to start doing some of the things that you do to make the cost to cover the cost. <laughs> yeah. So that's yes. basically branding. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, that, you know what, that used to be just like a business move. But now it's you know branding. what you could do? She's doing this thing called Interface. You could, uh, you could start. You could yeah, talk she to would be the best at it. On Interface. Tell everybody what Interface is. Drew. It's a, an app where you okay. can be an expert. Oh, right, right, right. It's not in the, I've heard of this. I think you've heard of Cameo. This well, is, okay. this is an expert. This is a different. This is for what experts. What am I? Okay, well, we're going to have to talk about you know, this. But we, we don't want to. And Drew does it. He get he charges eight hundred dollars an hour, and he can give one on one consultations. Shelly just got really. She just paid for Ivy School. Oh my right gosh! Because I need about three grand a month extra yeah. right now. Well, we could. We okay, could probably set that up. Let's for you. work. Let's you work this you out. You can't do treatment. Has to no, be no, no. It's got to be like education. Yeah. Okay, of yeah, course. Cannabis of course. education. Right. Cannabis in the brain. Young people and cannabis. There's but, uh, three psychoeducation. Top- I just Here gave I you three. But the internet topics is sort of strangely repriced everything. Okay. Because uh, I get thirty six dollars or forty two dollars something for every fifteen minutes for Medicare. That's all I get. That's, That's all I get. That's what I, I get it for. So for an hour of practicing medicine, I can't. For an that. hour of practicing medicine, no. I make about fifty dollars because I have to hundred dollars in overhead. Stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot so, of overhead. So, but all of a sudden, the and, internet, and you ma- can charge whatever you want. Yes. So, your time so look at it's empowered clinicians. It's empowered. So the internet and social media. Getting back to our guests, it's empowered. It's changed the world, and it's empowered so many different obviously individuals. Obviously, I need to get that. Yeah, well, Shelly, you're behind the behind I am. The I know. You're right. But you I have been a, raising so a daughter. I have a, been raising a, a daughter, Pinsky though. You need a Susan Pinsky in your life. But I do need daughter. a Susan Pinsky. <laughs> but you guys, I've always known that. <laughs> but you guys, with <laughs> a blessing, a with many blessings come curses. And this divisiveness mm-hmm. and this mean-spiritedness yes. and this the oh, anxiety yeah, that... That we were talking about earlier, that's caused by people being attacked or criticized on the internet. Yep. Um, that's that's the fallout from it. That's the collateral damage. But it has empowered yeah. millions of people. I would say models most of all. When you talk Look about at the Kardashians, yeah. When you talk about a <laughs> typical model that say was a, I was acquaintance with in the eighties, Shelley. Let's they say they made they were lucky to make you know four grand a month. You know, working different shows, they were treated like meat. They would be up for jobs and not get them. They would miss them because they were out all night with me. It was a <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Like, you were not a good so it was on not a, a it was industry. not a safe Absolutely. life to live in. And here yeah. they starved themselves. They've made it through all so many hoops it takes to get to that place mm-hmm. and they're still treated like shit i like the new modern where you can brand yourself and mm-hmm. have a million followers and empower yourself economically right and yeah. then like susan Absolutely. says and then they come and, back and, and ask you to I, do the catwalk with, uh, because you have a million girls, followers like, like i was saying before if i have to talk to them like if they're my sisters honestly i will tell them to to go for it you know, that path, because mm-hmm. like you were talking about business money, well, you can make a lot of money through brands, because again, for brands, that that's a new way to, to sell, right? And mm-hmm. so it's the new commercial, I would say. Right. Um, even that, it, even that has to be monitored. I mean, I think that there was a little bit of too much, uh, I would say, pushing of that brands start not to like that they're starting i think in a positive way like like i was saying at the very beginning to get related to messages so again they try to find those people that also have a brain you know it's like okay you're cute and everything but what are we saying through this you know campaign because at the end and this is very millennial of course because millennials you know like experiences Mm -hmm. (laughs) like you know people say about uh the millennial generation but 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 it's true. Uh, basically, through a campaign with an influencer, uh, brands trying to find a way to give experiences. I would say to their customers, you know, to be uh, associated, to feel part of something, and that's why many times they also try to find a message that is, like we were saying, empowering that uh, or, or can do something. Sometimes even related to charities, so that. People can really feel, you know, that they are doing something, and there are a lot of brands that are doing that. Yeah. And I think that is a good way, I would say. We, we got a break. We, we got a break. Drew has that look where part of this you like and part of this you don't like. I can tell. Right. Let's talk about it after the All break. Right, I'll take a little break. Be right back. 
Let's talk about CBD. It's, of course, everywhere today. It's a hot topic, and I get asked about it all the time. Bottom line, although there are way more claims, there is very little clinical evidence just yet. The the science is lagging behind, but many people are using it and reporting anecdotally very good results. I want to first define exactly what we're talking about here. CBD or cannabidiol is an extract from hemp. And while you might associate it with marijuana, CBD is the non-high, non-rewarding component of hemp. And it's responsible for other effects, calming, sleep, not high. Now, about the products. There are a ton of them out there today. Forget the vast array of reported health benefits. It's important to be aware of what you're buying. I was recently introduced to a company called Select CBD, an Oregon-based company that focuses on high-quality ingredients and manufacturing standards. No hype. Their CBD-based products are available in a wide range of formulations and flavors, each of which is clearly described to you so you can make an informed decision without promises that seem too good to be true. Like I said, the reported benefits of CBD are compelling, and I'm excited to see how things develop with the science as this booming industry gets going. So if you want to try CBD, you might check out Select CBD. To learn more, go to drdrew.com slash select. That is my site, drdrew.com slash S-E-L-E-C-T. For a limited time, you can save 25% at checkout with the code DRDREW. We are back. We have Simonetta Lean. Everything is possible is the novel. The Wish Wall on Amazon Prime is where you can see her. I, I'm just thinking about it. I, I, I just am not – I don't know. I'm Do you like the Tom's it. Shoes idea? Do you like all these – because she talked about a philanthropic brand. So if you buy a pair of Tom's Shoes, they donate a pair of shoes, right? That's made yeah. – that has lifted Tom's to equal to Nike. But I understand, but it's – It's kind of a business hustle yeah, I was based say, for it's, millennials. It, it, it's exactly right. It's what I was sitting here thinking. God, geez, you know, what's, why is that different than a – company that is very successful and quietly gives philanthropic money away why do they have to beat their chest about it you know, mm-hmm. that used to be because considered that's a, what you have to do they used to be considered unsightly like yes you know lack of decorum yeah and it's like what you're well, now it's like about that as though, as, though it did, <laughs> as though it didn't happen before it has always happened and well, now people no, are getting just, paid for it hmm. it's sort of because interesting if you're making I, a ton of money you just have to say well you know i i try to give back it's what but they always have that's uh, true. They always have. Uh, and now it's in a, maybe building it into the business is something that we just have well, to do. Well, the thing about fashion, Drew, is that, you know, a lot of a lot of people love fashion. They spend a lot of money on fashion. And to have your place of, of philanthropic giving is always a good thing. It just they've done it for forever and it's it's just the way it works because it is kind well, of you guys a, want to talk about fashion, Shelly and Susan, Well I go love ahead. I, I just have to say that I, I have I looked at your at your clothing and I love it. And, and I think that you. you're it's inspirational. You're very I think you're very inspirational and, and I, I give you a lot of credit um, for in in such a, a competitive arena as fashion that you've um, been able to to, you know, rise above a lot of the pettiness around fashion and that you've been able to move into directions of helping others with your with your Thank giving. You. And and I think that that's amazing. And I think that, you know, you're talented and, and incredibly bright. And she's a workaholic. So you're just not like a you, millennial. Yes. She's not a millennial. <laughs> I know. Come I on. I work too many hours a day. I know. I know. I work too much. <laughs> but you have that in common. And again, this is another millennial terminology. I'm very passionate about it, but it's true. I mean, I really like, and, and to respond also to um, what you guys were saying before about the people who are always doing uh, the charity. That's true. But like, like we were saying, the world has changed. And also you have to see about the, um, the era that we're living. What I'm trying to say is that, for instance, actors, actresses, they were always doing that. They were doing it for free, but also... I mean, the, the, the pay that, I mean, the, they were paying, paid million of dollars, right? So it's, it's kind of, it's, the, the time has changed. So yes, you can do, of course, a nice business out of social media, but it's not like that. It's not like the huge, you know, kind of things. And so I think, I believe, and this is, again, my experience. I cannot talk for other people, but there's a lot of people that are very genuine about it. And they really, you really see they are passionate about a message that they're, they are, you know, trying to give out also through a brand. And I think that, again, I don't know. I, I personally, for instance, the, the one of my clothing line is done with, um, in collaboration with a fa- fashion designer. I know for a fact that she really does. She's actually originally from India. 
her name is Shaida Paradis. And she actually, I know that for a fact that she goes with part of the proceeds and she goes to try to help women uh, to become entrepreneurs in India. Uh, there's another brand that I collaborated with. They're also uh, from, from India and they do bags. And they actually, they, they train their, their, their people to create those bags. They're like really, honestly, guys that they didn't have a chance in life. And they decided to, uh, you know, train them, bring them back and to, you know, really teach them uh, something, you know, give them a tool to, to give them a profession. Uh, there's another fashion uh, collection. It's um, uh, I don't remember exactly the name. It's uh, but they, they what they do is and again they they go to Africa and they bring women and they teach them how to actually create something and they make money and they can actually use their money to go to college. So there's a lot of that and it's real. I I, I believe me. It's it's mm. it's no, it's a hundred percent real. real. Mm-hmm. It's real. It's just, it's the way things are that, that people, people, it's called, there's a great documentary that Kirit Baruth made mm-hmm. that, uh, um, <coughs> that made Bob and the Monster called We Live in Public. We now, everyone on earth lives in public. So your philanthropy is going to be in public. Everything is in public. My children are in yeah. public. You know, I posted a picture of Sid when she was swimming in a two-year-old swimming in a play, you know, a wa- people were telling me, like, you know, perverts are going to look at that picture and jack off. <laughs> I said, that's not my problem. Yeah. Right? She's a little girl playing in a, it's summertime. It's cute. It's, in a, it's cute. But how can you live your whole life worrying about that, the anxiety that the internet causes? Uh, that, oh, some pervert's going to be jacking off to your two-year-old kid. That's his prerogative, I guess. That's true. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So we're living in public. We're all interacting 24 hours a day, Which seven a days a week, all the time. And we don't even really know what it is that's going to come of all this. Mm-hmm. But definitely, no, yet. definitely, yet. if you do a good act, you put it on Instagram. Hmm. You know what I mean? Different than the generation we grew up in. You do a good act because you owe because you're so you've been so blessed, and, and, and you, you and you, and you do it decorum. Quietly. You do it yeah. quietly, and you don't seek. There's only I, I'll say this. I have some friends that do things very quietly, right? Everyone around them says, don't do it quietly. Everyone else does it publicly. Shelley. And they've decided, <laughs> they've decided, no, we want to do things the old-fashioned way. Yeah. But but what is the point of doing it quietly or doing it on the Self-aggrandizement. But is that the point? <laughs> what is the real point? Of, of, of putting it out versus of not putting, putting it out? Of putting it out versus not putting it out. My feeling is, is that things that are done for charity to help others – um, is associated with humility and humbleness and selflessness and selflessness and, and those so are the gifts that you receive right. when you are doing so things humbly. But this is a new this is out. a new version, guys. This so is that's a new what version. I'm asking: is is there? I'm sure there is. Um, there is pros and cons to both uh, yep. philosophies around yep. doing that. I'm a I'm a quieter person. I know it doesn't sound like that. Yeah, right but if you made second. three billion dollars in fashion, you'd want to give back. Would, like you'd yes, be like, I you would know, give I could probably back. give away. You know, I also need a tax break or whatever. But um, you know, the, that's the thing. There's so much money in fashion. I just love when you see donors. Well, I wish that I could because I do a lot of stuff, and that, you see donors, <laughs> and somebody gives. And the donation is anonymous; doesn't even have their name attached. Yeah, but that's whatever. the old kind of way. Yeah, and a lot I, and of people you, like well, that. You, but you got to respect it. Older people like me and Drew are going to like if the, I gave the a different way. way. I'd want way. everybody to know. Right, I, did I guess it. the bottom line is it's it's different different goals, right? It, different Some strokes for different the folks. Full spiritual benefit of giving it's selfless. It's selfless. If you want to just anonymous. do it to build your brand, or you want to do it and to get some benefit and to do what's right, you can do it publicly. Well, well, let's look at. I think shining. people just don't want other people to be jealous of them. No, but you can use your st- social media standing to shine a light on. Because so yeah. we certainly do that yeah. on the L.A. Unified School District, one of the worst in the history of mankind. Mm-hmm. Well, so, 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 so you're probably. Property taxes are going up to keep funding that. So, so the idea of, yeah, Shelly had to start her own school so her kid could get educated and go to college. So you shine a light on the inadequacies of our school system by saying we've started a nonprofit charter school or we've started what Shelly did. We've started a nonprofit 
at music education school because the schools get billions of dollars yet don't have any music in them. Mm -hmm. the, to use social media to spotlight inadequacies. Mm -hmm. And you have to celebrate what you're doing true. in order to gain the attention sure. at the problem. Yeah, for sure. Right? What, let's talk about your charter school for a second. Yes. I, I, just was you feeling that Ivy's needs weren't being met? How did you get involved? She Have you ever heard her talk about it? No. She's been involved in this for 20, 15 years. Crazy. Yeah, 15 years. 15 fucking years she's we been running a charter, charter school, school, Drew. Did yeah. you ever hear her talk about it? No. Never. Mm -hmm. Because that's it's how one people of my used to be. Accomplishments. It really is one of my greatest <laughs> accomplishments. Sure. But I certainly, um, I certainly was under um, duress because I didn't have money for private school, and I was terrified of LA Unified. With with you know good reason. Good reason. With good reason. And my daughter is a special child and she needed special things and I um, was lucky enough to find some other folks that felt the same way about their kids and so we um, joined together to tr to start Los Feliz Charter School for the Arts and now um, Ivy's a senior in high school and, and you know graduating but we started when she was in kindergarten and that school ha is still going. What about going. people who crap on charter schools? Well I don't know how new charter schools are put together but ours started in a living room Hmm. And it was nonprofit, and it had to be Title I, which means it had to serve a certain population of low income, and we had to achieve that in the charter. Sure. And so I had to go out to all of the fairs for an entire 18 months to get people to sign up to even go and get this charter approved at the state level. Hmm. And I had, to in, I had to get people involved that were scared of charter schools or scared of this type of education that wasn't um wasn't uh sort of functional things that they were used to and it was out of the realm and so basically what we utilized was arts for children to learn and it was a it was a great great school and now ivy obviously is seeing the, the benefits of that and and she literally Grew up in Los Angeles proper, in the city of Los Angeles, in a small town type of school where the principal ate dinner at our apartment. Mm. So here's the thing that I love about this. Everything. We're a different here's the thing I love about it. Everything. Well, well, how about the fact that we've seen each other every day for those 15 yeah. years and you didn't know that was I going on? Gonna... Because you didn't go around bragging about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. She was too busy. Yeah, it's very hard but, for but me to But I still, to, politically, to I wish that. she would tell the story over and over because we need the people to support that kind of thing and to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, the... when this whole hey, strike hey, was hey, happening. Hey, Simonetta. Oh, sorry. sorry. Simonetta. Ne next. Yes. next. Your next uh, wish wall has got to be about... What Shelly did. We'll get, we'll get, a, get another one going. Get another charter school going. We need, have Shelly tell you how she did it, and then you find a group and you do another one. Do yeah. another charter school. I, I want to know from Simonetta what the ShahidaParids.com Heart to Heart uh, Foundation is, how that works. Like I've if, read about everybody's that. Everybody's got to see this fashion. It's really cool. It looks like Cavalli, which is Thank one of you. my favorite Now, designers. that is actually so was our, our clothing line. So she uh, came to me because of me as an influencer. And then she discovered that I had this passion that got translated into a, a, a charity because at the beginning it was honestly, it was a blog that I started actually with Vanity Fair in Italy. Uh, I was interviewing celebrities about how they uh, basically achieve their, their goals, their dreams. And, and that, that's how it started. And then I realized that I was lacking uh, the everyday people. And so I put up a blog and I started to ask the people, what is your dream? You know, what, 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 you, what are you holding on? And, uh, and my thing was actually, uh, and it's something that I've, I've, uh, I've learned in India. In India, they have uh, actually these wish trees. And the idea is that you, you write your wish and then you hang it in the tree and you kind of give it to the universe. And so to me, it was a little bit of uh, the same idea. Of, of course, of, it was more public, but it was like, put it out there, you know, take it out because, and this is, of course, they'll, they'll teach you that also in psychology or in, in counselor, because I'm, I'm also a counselor. I've studied a lot this, the fact that when you write your things down, when you write your wishes, when you write your goals, then you start, you know, to have them clear in your mind. And so that was my first uh, input. And that's where I, it started. And then because when I, when I actually moved to the U.S., um, I went to the city of Philadelphia and I share this idea of putting that concept, that online content into reality. Uh, I'm also an artist. My first degree is in fine art. I'm a, I'm a painter. And so I was passionate about murals. In Philadelphia, actually, I don't know if you guys know, but we have 
uh, the biggest uh, mural uh, art that actually there the, that that we can find in, in the United States right now. But their murals are amazing. And so I went to speak with a counselor in the city, and I said, "Why don't we do kind of a a, a, a wish wall, so something visual?" And they liked it so much. So when uh, Pope Francis came to Philadelphia, they decided to sponsor an event, and I put up my first uh, real, you know, uh, wish wall. Real meaning, you know, something that people can come and actually write uh, wow, in there. Cool. So what and part I was of, so what part of town impressed is because I had like a turnout of people. I I don't know. It was completely fill up with wishes from and actually people ask me what kind of wishes honestly there 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 are also of course wishes that are personal but many are a reflection to me to uh to society to the city it's very from a, a philanthropic point of view it's very interesting because through the wish wall in uh different cities you can actually understand the reality around you it's, it's very very uh, unique and in that case, I actually was attracted by a wish that um, a woman wrote. So she came, she wrote this wish, and then she started crying and she ran away. I ran after her, and I don't know. I felt this empathy with her, and I asked her, "What's going on?" And uh, this was a sister of, uh, uh, I mean, a young woman. Uh, she was actually my age. She was 33 at that time, and when she passed away. She was killed in a hit and run accident. And, um, you know, like you, you guys know, whenever you live in a big city, the city do a little bit for you. And then you are one of the many right stories. Mm -hmm. And so she came to me and say, I just wish for, you know, some justice. I I want to find this person. And I want also that the city will not forget my daughter, my sister, actually, I was Mm -hmm. a sister. So. I went to the city and I started to to speak about this story because I was very touched by it. And I said, what can I do? I mean, at that point, imagine that I moved from Italy in 2015, I would say it was January. That was September 2015. I just established the Wish Wall Foundation. And I, I didn't even know anything about, you know, American laws. And I was like, what, what can we do? And so we started. And my idea was I want to rename a street after this woman. Mm-hmm. And when I started to say that, everyone told me it's not going to be possible. I mean, maybe in two years or some. I said no, because this woman died on uh, December 23rd. So two days before Christmas. And I said, we're September. There's no way that I'm going to leave this family, you know, without a Christmas, you know, because they're going to, I mean, that, that actually would have been the first year without her. And they told me there's, there's just forget about it. I mean, it's Philadelphia. It's a big city. And I don't know what happened. And I started to really to, to call everybody. I started to, I don't know. I really wanted to help them. And believe it or not, on December 23rd, there was there were the people from the city putting up the, the sign. And actually, that street where she grew up was permanently renamed uh, after her. Her name was Theresa Pozzi. And so now you go and it, the, the street's name is Kimball Street. So it's now Kimball Street, uh, Theresa Pozzi's way. Aww. So that happened, actually, in two months, <laughs> record time. Yeah, that And family. then after that, yeah, that was, I, I, believe me, when I tell this story, it still have goosebumps because it seems kind of a miracle to me and then after that of course the, the the biggest one was that they wanted to 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 you know catch a killer and even that I said listen I'm you know I'm just a a woman that I mean what, what can I do for this I don't work in you know with the police I, I don't know what to do but then I just used my brain and I said okay but how much reward do you guys put two thousand dollars I said no one will ever speak for two thousand dollars and so I convinced the city and then Triple A and then Clear Channel to put um, higher uh, reward uh, for, uh, I think it was $15,000. And Clear Channel was so nice. They put up like a big billboard, you know, when, when actually, where actually she was killed, saying about the new rewards and, you know, hoping. And actually, a, a year later, exactly, it was around pretty much uh, still December that time someone finally spoke up and they actually caught him. I went to the trial with them and he's in jail. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> and then the, the criminal justice department called me and said, hey, do you want to work with us? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that story's on our first that. episode. Of I the watched Wishwell. the first episode and, and I, I thought, you know, this is a, an amazing story. That and, is and all I'm true. So, and, so and, and, and to respond, actually, to well, what you guys were saying before, for instance, 
Yes, there are. There is an old way of doing charity, and you know, and not saying. And I think it's 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 amazing. There's a lot of my parents are like this, and I absolutely respect that. There is another way. Uh, there is like also what you guys were saying, trying to put up like put outside of your world a light, like something to say, okay, I'm doing this. I think they both can coexist. And they both are good. In my um, in my way, what happened is that I did that. That was me, Simonetta, just really trying to pay forward because that was a girl like my age. That could have been me. I really felt so. Uh, I, I needed to do something. And 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 then because I'm in this uh, entertainment business, I just happened to speak about it with with a someone who said, "Oh my God, that is a story for a TV show." And then. It just happened that, you know, it happened and became then an episode of the TV show, uh, the TV show. And actually, the family was so uh, graceful, you know, mm-hmm. because the beautiful thing is that, of course, there was a lot of anger and a lot of, you know, grief. But they told me, hey, it, sharing this story can inspire a lot of other families that are going through the same. Right. Because. Uh, honestly, they felt completely left alone. And yet I sure. cannot of course fix the problems of everyone but I can at least you know give them a hope that if I did it you know at least it's possible to move something that was the intent and that is the intent that I uh, also try to 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 pursue with the wish well foundation you know really to try to give what I call meaningful wishes uh, a chance to bring them outside also because like for instance lately I've been very passionate about a couple of um wishes one in the philippines one in uh in africa and they are uh, pretty much, uh, there are children um that are that are, we've been trying to to help and uh, both of them have something uh tied to uh literacy and trying really to um bring more awareness about the fact that you know these children uh m- many times don't even know how to read and write so that was very important to me but again our support was uh relatively so inexpensive that to me the idea is i want to share these stories because i want to you know empower you and you and you right See, so that, then tell that you, hey, I think, I think you know with a small part is, you can do a lot that is that, that, far... that is i think the beauty of social media <laughs> okay yeah, yeah that is that it. is far the the if you, i think what you've done goes far beyond the the rather amazing accomplishments you've been able to succeed to to fulfill but Showing that one person can make a difference is really what's behind yes. all this, and that's and that, inspire that is other a, people to make a difference. Right. Well, Shelly does that every day. Every day, Shelly did it. Bob does that the every potheads. day. Dealing with the potheads. Dealing with the potheads. Well, I'm yeah. I'm thinking of of you know trying to to do something around moving forward with with my clients and trying to inspire them instead of try to you know um, sort of get them well, but try to inspire them to want to want be to well. Change their lives. Use their yeah. lives. Simonetta, I gotta let you go. We we can follow you. Thank you you so much. At Simonetta Lean, L E I N, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Wishwall on Amazon Prime, thewishwall.org. Well done, my dear, and thank you for joining us. And also, check out our fashions. They're amazing. Oh, that's it. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, the link there. Don't yes. you go to Dr. Thank Drew, you so much. Doc, this life, Dr. Drew. We're going Lincoln. shopping. Yeah. Shelly and I are going shopping. Yeah, we're going to go shopping. <laughs> we're gonna put it up Thank there. you. Yeah, so um, also, uh, thanks again for coming. We could talk all day, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you yeah, so thanks much. Thanks, Amanda. Bye-bye. Uh, I really Be appreciate well. you guys. Bye. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thank summer you. there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So um, are you going to hang in? I don't know. That's the question. That is the question. Um, it's a fight. If you don't, what would you do? Hmm. Brand Can herself. I go back to Brand school? Brand herself. <laughs> Work with Simonetta. There's a yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. synergy yeah. there. Yeah, no, definitely. Shelly is a brand. I mean, Maybe it is time for you to do something else. It might be. It might be. Um, that, oh, don't that's let what Paul I'm hear thinking. this podcast. No, I know. Don't oh, my God. God. Oh, God. Well, we're just talking. Yeah, I just, I don't know if I'm in for another fight. I've, I've really um, struggled around the cannabis issue at this point, and... Um, the, because the people third, won't get sober, they just refuse. They they refuse to get sober, and 
at this sober point. Sober isn't what sober. Sober doesn't mean what sober used I, to I mean. I understand that, but you, the three of us know that in order to really thrive and do the kind of work we like to do and to fully recover, to you fully have to recover. be you gotta you understand. Have to be sober. So I have the luxury yeah. that I'm dealing with mostly like 45, 50 year old, 60 year old yeah. adults. Shelly deals with a whole different population, I which 18 I to just, 25. I, I just only, I can only help those people. Yeah. I concluded that about two years ago. Like, I really, I like millennials. I, you know, I like the whole drama and chaos of it all. But the fact is, when a, when a 45-year-old, 55-year-old man finally wants to get sober, I know how to help them. Right. And it's so, it feels so purposeful. Right. It does. It right? does. It, and it, in a weird so way, different. The, the young ones don't want what you got. They don't. They don't want what I have. Yeah. And, and, and that's okay. <laughs> and that's okay. But I, I struggle with the ethics around saying that I am uh, abstinence-based program. That is developing uh, curriculum that's helping people to maintain recovery. And then what the reality is, is that I'm trying to coax them from hitting their, you know, weed pens uh, on the way to treatment. <laughs> on, the way to, on the way to group therapy. Yeah. Can you imagine, so Drew, incredible. if at Briar, you know, we had smoke break and they all just hit their... Their no. CBD oil pens. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's very difficult, and and it is. What I like about it is I'm leaning into the challenge right now. Mm-hmm. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, it's gonna good happen. for you right now because you're going to have an empty nest here pretty soon. So you got to have something. I to need a cause. Get you up in the morning. <laughs> Clearly need a cause. You know, but maybe me. there's something you know in social media or something. There might I be think, something else yeah, going something on. Something else. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I know I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty tired of the make uh, cannabis work, uh, you know, treatment centers. Mm -hmm. It's just talking to these young kids and and this this, the inundation of substance They know that it's wrong that people like us are kowtowing to that. They well, know. Do you understand what I'm saying? They? The clients yeah. themselves. But I'm like, fighting. Really? So. really? But my, You're I'm fighting, fighting. It, but a lot, but, of, but, a lot but, of people here, aren't. But the thing is, yeah. I have no problem with people on any kind of maintenance. Heroin maintenance, marijuana maintenance, methadone maintenance, suboxone maintenance. And and they would anyone in any four of those categories would benefit from some kind of supportive therapies and some vocational rehab. I would interest in being part of that. Because yeah, that's, that is a, that's what you have that, to decide, that right? Is literally, it's literally like saying, you know, I'm a physical therapist and I'm only going to work with people that refuse to do what I tell them to do. Go on the ball. And, that would but, be me. And, I right. refuse yeah. to go on the ball right, right. and roll around. That's right. And, well, maybe we could spend some time and I could motivate could you talk to do about a little something. Or we could maybe get a joint moved here and there. And there's people that can do that kind of work. And, yeah. and that's okay. I'm not judging it. I ain't interested in doing it because yeah. it, it, it it's too dangerous. It doesn't go anywhere. It's what are we doing? What are we I doing? I just realized you might just might just the weed maintenance. But might I be just realized whatever. What what? Yeah. The, Maybe Shelley's population you changed because I was like her. If you think about what she's saying, yeah. I was ra- I was saying the same things two and three and four years ago. Yeah. I just realized I can't deal with them. Okay. Well, you're saying so, what I'm and, saying now, and it right. happened. Right. It happened mm-hmm. at. Inpatient when I was doing mm-hmm. the brain lecture that we kind of copy or yeah. mi- Yours, amygdala yeah. Yeah. lecture. Uh-huh. I'm doing it for a group of like 30 millennial drug addicts in treatment. And 19 year old girl raises her hand and just goes, Well, I just disagree with all that. Yeah. And I said, In Bob like genuine authenticity, yes. uh-huh. who gives a fuck what you think? <laughs> oh my God, you should have seen how they wanted to kill me. Oh, they yeah. wanted to run me out on a rail. Of course. And I ran out and I'm driving home and I'm like, I called Evan and I said, I think I really fucked up right now. Now you got to damage control because, uh-huh. like, they wanted me dead. The other clients, yes, they're they like, "Who? How you treated me, all this stuff? Oh, you're yeah. you're yeah. a horrible person. You're a misogynist. Mm-hmm. How could yeah. you say that to somebody? You're emotionally violent." Mm-hmm. I just told her the truth. Who gives a fuck what a 19 year old drug addict, heroin addict in treatment thinks? See, I think right there, <laughs> but I think right there is the core issue, right? It is, is the that, core that they're issue. coddled. I stopped dealing with 19 year old drug addicts. Right, they're coddled <laughs> to the point that you can't even do treatment. And so maybe somebody else will invent something other than what we do, or maybe they will un- well, unfortunately a it's suffer a as a result of the coddling. It's it's a it's it's a meeting the client where they are, and that if they don't if if they can't get sober, can they benefit from treatment? Is the question. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I don't know the answers. But do you want to do know, that treatment? Do, yeah, yeah, what do I? And right. and that has always been the one old, of the but questions. The, but the thing that we do has great value. They're lining up to pay for it because they want it. I grown adults want it. Yeah. Grown adults want well, it. Well, maybe these kids will grow up and eventually get to the point. Yeah. Oh, and, there you and go. So There's then you're hope. planting yeah. seeds, right? Yeah. Then you're planting seeds. And that's what I'm talking about yeah. is that. If if I turn away from the population I have to work with, then who is going to work with them and what are well, those seeds that are going to be planted? I, I would argue that you need somebody with about 10% or 20% of the skill set that you have because that 80 or 90%, they're not getting it. No, 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 they're so, not getting it. So it, it doesn't need, I, you don't need another <laughs> Shelly to do the work. But here's what some of my true, clients, true. some of my clients, of the, we call it the professional scripture. Yeah. They'll say, <laughs> when Suboxone comes up, they'll, they're a 45-year-old uh, uh, tech guy said to me a couple of weeks ago, Dude, I was on it for 10 years. It doesn't fucking work. <laughs> 45-year-olds yeah. know that Suboxone doesn't, doesn't work. 22-year-olds don't. That's right. No. And That's as we it. always say, they have to go do it. It's a new version of having and to go. And that's a good example. Go so back. You have to do it for 10 years till you realize it doesn't work. You have to go experiment. <laughs> they have to go experiment and learn on their own. They don't want to hear it from us. And uh, okay, that's reality, and that's, we have to accept things as they are. That that is the reality, yeah. and and working in the framework of what you know, third party payer, and then you know the me- the the medical uh, you know medically piece managed and, care. And the, it's, they have initials for all this stuff. What's M- MAT? MAT yes. medically, medically assisted, assisted treatment. treatment. Yes. Yeah. What and, the fuck is that? It's well, M-A-T. that's what <laughs> suboxone. But that but that's what I'm doing. Oh, come on, Shelly. It's going to be all right. It's Sunday. We're going to have a nice day. Okay, let's have a nice day. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm not on medically managed. Well, you're I would just not, argue, you're not on MAT. I, no. I would argue that Shelly's talents could be used Better. more fully. Somewhere else. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. Maybe Perhaps. so. Perhaps. All right. Well, that's great. I'm glad I came here today. Perhaps. but, but Maybe no, you could you know. get back in a band. You've always wanted to be in a band. <laughs> you know, she it's played funny with Keith you Richards, you know. That. I wow. did not. My, she my would, ex <laughs> You were on stage. Yeah, it doesn't mean that I had anything to do with Keith Richards. But I like how Bob is so, you know, generous with, you know, my talents. It's, you it's could really be a fantastic. singer in a band. Trust me, you're Shelly the Shark. Yes, I know. But the problem is that you need to actually be able to sing. I well, think. Ivy, Ivy could teach I don't know, you. Drew, Ivy, Drew, Ivy could teach you. Do we have to sing? Not anymore. Be, not anymore. Well, he could sing and he can't I know, get that's a gig. I mean. He can't get a gig. <laughs> He's a good singer. <laughs> All right. We're going to wrap this up. <laughs> Thank right, you. Guys, Thank you, guys. Love coming here. Thank Thanks. you so Bye. much, Susan. Love you guys. Thank you, Nate. All right. See you next Thank time. You guys. Bye. Bye. All right. That's about it for this episode of This Life. Thanks for listening and subscribing on your favorite platforms. Rate us five stars and tell a friend. Also, be sure to visit drdrew.com for the latest news. We'll tell you where you can find all of our health-related content, including the latest in-depth series, The History of Opium. You can now listen to it on the weekly Infusion podcast. We have some great and very interesting and appropriate interviews with key historical players in the history of opium. We're excited about our newest podcast, Dr. Drew After Dark, which has been described as a dark web reboot of Loveline. It's the hottest guest spot for all the most popular comedians. Beware, it is for a mature audience. It is kind of a reboot of Loveline. You can hear the episodes first in a podcast form Thursday. Then on Friday, you can watch all the video episodes when the YouTube page drops on the Your Mom's House YouTube channel. New episodes every week. Subscribe, tell a friend. Also on Doctor.com, you can find Swole Patrol, our health and fitness podcast with Mike Catherwood. If you want something a bit more refined that will expand your intellectual horizons, please subscribe to the Dr. Drew Podcast, where I feature a wide variety of very interesting and important guests. Get in-depth interviews there. Last but not least, me and Adam, Adam and Dr. Drew Show Podcast. It's a lot of fun, and we are still together, and you can get it five days a week. So go to drdrew.com, please tell a friend, and we thank you for it. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.